This is part three of Mr. Foot, <laughs> our Bigfoot figurine. In the previous two episodes, you saw me make these arms and cast them in resin. And they're all ready to go. I've got them all cleaned up here on the ends. Let's take, cut off, I cut off all the sprues and vents and smoothed them out and they're all ready to go. And we're gonna use these arms to fit to the body. We're gonna use this, these hard plastic pieces to make that connection to the body fit. So we'll do that. But before we get started on Mr. Foot, I wanted to um, have a piece of chocolate. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. My friend Michael runs a YouTube channel called Nerdtronic, and it's a 3D printing channel. And every year for Christmas, he gives out chocolate, sends chocolate to all his friends. So in this year, he decided he would 3D print the chocolate designs, but he didn't 3D print chocolate, he printed resin. And from those resin prints, he wanted to make a silicone rubber mold so he could cast the pieces in chocolate. But Michael doesn't know anything about silicone rubber mold making, so he found me on YouTube, contacted me and said, hey, how do I do this? And I made a guest appearance on his channel. So <laughs> go check this video out. I, he sent me these chocolates, which is fun for me because I get to eat one. Um, he went through the whole process. He designed them in CAD, he printed them, he made the molds, and then he made the chocolates. So you see the whole process in the video. So you definitely want to go check it out. So now I'm going to test one out. Oh yeah, very nice, <laughs> very nice. Thanks, Michael. It was really fun working with you. You've got a fantastic channel, and I look forward to seeing what you work on next. There's a number of things that we need to do to prep Mr. Foot here for molding and casting. Uh, we went over them in the first video. We talked about a few of them, but let's just kind of recap now. We have to deal with these teeth because they're undercut. There's space behind them. It's not gonna work. Uh, we have lots and lots of areas where there's undercuts in the fur, like in there. We're gonna deal with all of that. Oh, one big one is his feet aren't flat. They're nowhere near flat. He rocks. So, uh, he, and I don't even think he stands. He doesn't. So his feet aren't flat. We're gonna have to flatten his feet. I don't know if you can see that. We'll flatten his feet. Uh, there's lots of areas that we're gonna have to deal with in terms of catching bubbles. And uh, I'm gonna go through, for instance, uh, this chin bump here, I don't know if you can see it, but this chin bump here uh, is this whole fringe is a major, he's going to sit like this in the mold. So this whole fringe here is just a major play. The whole thing will catch bubbles. It's just one big gigantic bubble. So we're going to have to modify a uh, vent that, uh, that, that just allows that not to happen, but also connect this bump here to that. Um, because I really want to cut the body like this on down the sides and uh, only cut as far as the shoulders and hopefully not even have to cut anywhere near around the head, just that'll be one piece, except that there's no way that I'm not going to be able to do that because I'm going to have to release out. I'm going to have to vent this whole part of the face and I'm going to have to release it out. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to make a custom fit, a custom shaped vent connection between the neck fringe and the vent. And I'm probably just going to vent it to the shortest spot. Uh, but that's going to mean there's going to be a cut in the middle, in the body, no matter what we do. We're just not going to be able to release this out, uh, release the air out of this part unless we do that. So, and then there's last minute things. For instance, I notice because I'm, because of the way he gets handled, uh, here I hold him like, like this and this. So I've got flat spots, as you can see in the fur. So after I get him on his base, all ready to go, all finished up, I'll come through and I'll clean up and re-sculpt those flat spots and make, those, make that fur look nicer than it does right now. The modifications that I'm gonna make on this guy are pretty extensive. And so I don't think that I'm going to do many of them on camera. I keep reminding myself, this is not a sculpting channel. This is a, uh, a molding and casting channel. So I'm not going to have you sit through a half an hour edited version of me making all the mods. Here, I just cut the teeth off, though. Bye-bye, <laughs> teeth. Wow, that's deep in there. See, that is so deep down inside there. That is not going to work. So we're going to be filling in that. Um, 
at any rate, but the, I, what I really did want to show you is the idea about using plastic parts to fit against clay parts uh, to make the fits to make it fit well. So what I'll do is jam this. Let's find the position that it goes into. It's about, it's about like that. Okay, yeah, there it goes. Okay, so it fits in like that. So I'm going to push this on. And what that's going to do for me is a couple of things. One is it's going to tell me my hole is way too deep. But also, if you notice, it marked out. See how it mashed down the clay? It marked out where I need to sculpt and remove clay to get a nice fit. So I'll be scraping out the clay here and here and just working it until I get a nice mating fit with the part. See them in here? Right in there. It sort of marked it out for me. And that makes it a lot easier to fit stuff in. I also see kind of a wicked undercut in there, so I'll patch in. Again, I'm not going to sit here and make you suffer while I re-sculpt this piece. See how that's fitting now. Oh, it just dropped right. See, it just dropped right in there. Now there's still some gap, but uh, like under there and stuff. But gaps don't bother me as much as bumps because they're very easy to fill. What I'm thinking about, here's the other thing. This is all should be all just shaggy, hairy fur, but that is, you're never going to be able to cast that because when it's in the mold, all that sh shaggy, hairy fur is going to be facing up. You understand what I'm saying? It's going to be facing this way. So I'm, it's like, like all the shag. There's no way. Every single one of those points is going to catch a bubble. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure we cut them all off. I'm literally going to go around and just make this a flat surface. Like that. And why am I doing that? The penalty that Larry who sculpted Big Mr. Foot here, is going to have to pay, is that he didn't plan for molding and casting. So if we flatten this edge like that, we're much less likely to catch bubbles. And even if we do, it doesn't really matter that much because once we fit them together, he's going to have to sculpt the connection. And I would recommend he use Matt Hughes's Magic Sculpt or Epoxy Sculpt to sculpt the hairs and make this connection. Like maybe make big massive hairy shoulders that just completely close up that connection. So this is one of those times when your casting is going to require some post sculpting. It just is. And um, otherwise, it's just not going to work. So that's how that's going to work with the arms. Both arms are going to be exactly the same way. But I just wanted to show you that. And now we can go forward. I have not finished sculpting and, and refining everything and sculpting the hairs and all like that. But what I want to do is get him mounted to his base before I try to finish the sculpting. If nothing else, it gives me something to grab a hold of while I work on him. So I've just scribbled out an indication of where his feet go. Um, he does want to fall over, so I'm, make, I'm just going to give him a little prop in there, a little drill bit prop. And one of the ways that you can mark out uh, we got to design a mold case, and one of the ways that we can do that is to just bring a square in within about a quarter of an inch of him. Just make a dot. Kind of do that all the way around him. Just about like that. Just, you just kind of go around. And then I'm just dropping points, basically, is what I'm doing. Dropping points. Because this is going to tell me the absolute smallest size and configuration for my base and for the box itself, the mold box, and what shape it's going to be. Now, the simplest thing to do would be just to build, build a big giant box around it. But you know me, I hate to spend the, that much rubber, expend that much rubber. Because if we build a square box, a big giant square box around him, uh, 
he's going to be expensive in rubber. Not only that, but like, like look at it from this side, sticks out all the way. You need about a quarter of an inch. I'm giving him about a quarter of an inch, but look at the look at the size of the of the mold case. How much rubber is behind him, and how much rubber is underneath him over here? He's got two big giant hunks of rubber. Uh, that it's just yeah, it's going to be a big boxy giant mold, and we need to figure this out if that's what we want to do. It dips in here, but of course, a one thing that you could do would be to make a brush-on mold or a case mold, and we might. I consider in this case doing exactly that because you can see what we've got going on here we've got a mold case that looks something like that that's our mold case shape Okay, so decision made. We're going to make ourselves a shaped, not a circular, but a shaped ovalish sort of uh, mold case. And I refine the shape into this red line, as you can see. And then I cut it out, figured out the size of the wood, and transferred it to the wood. Did all that ahead of time, save you some time. Here's a funny thing. This is a piece of scrounged wood, and uh, it happened to have a countersunk hole <laughs> exactly where I needed it. So all I did was kind of hog out the, the hole a little bit bigger. Let's go cut it out over on the handy dandy jigsaw. Fire it up. I did not want to cut into the frame, I just because I want to preserve that frame. So I just did it like that and that was perfect. So let's cut it out. Beautiful. Now we've got this uh, defect, which we're going to have to fix, but that will be simple. A little bit of wax and we're done. I'm going to clog that up with wax. And I have this part and this part is going to come in mighty handy too. And you will see why in a minute. With the base cut, it's time to position Mr. Foot on the base. And fortunately, he came ready made with a, with a hole in the foot and I just jammed a bamboo skewer down in there. Thing is, this hole <laughs> is not 90 degrees to the plane of his feet. So the way I fix that is, uh, the diameter of the, of the skewer is whatever it is, probably less than an eighth of an inch, it's probably some weird um, metric uh, bamboo-ish uh, measurement. Anyway, it's, it's smaller, so you cut an oversized hole. Took me three tries to get it right, and the reason how I did that was I just, set him down on the base, got out the old square again and went around and went, ooh, he's too close there. So by doing that, I discovered that that was where he belonged, right in there, was where he belonged. Now the hole is oversized to this and that compensates for the fact that this, this is not 90 degrees to, to this plane. It doesn't have to be, it's got some room, it's got some wiggle room and I'm just gonna pack that with epoxy, glue him in there or wax, actually probably wax to make him easier to take apart. I will set him in there. And then what I did was I took some cardboard just to check his positioning and wrapped it all around, went all around, just checking, checking, checking to make sure. And I it turned out that this was a good location. So this ram board is same stuff that's on my floor here and my new favorite material in the world is gonna be the bolt case for this, uh, it's paper, obviously heavy cardboard. Therefore, we're gonna wax it mightily. And that's another bit of business we'll be doing in a second here. So the question is, what's the dimensions of the piece of ram board that I've gotta make to wrap this thing? That is a good question. Let's figure it out. First of all, let's figure out the height. Um, looking, let's see, what are we doing here? What are we doing, what are we doing? Now I want to make the thing higher than the mold is gonna be. That way I have plenty of fudge room. So let's see what that looks like. That's plenty tall. It won't be that deep over, you know, the, the rubber will just be about a quarter of an inch above his highest point. 
So that's eight inches. Yep, eight inches. Okay, so we'll make it eight by, but how do we know um, this whole bit of business, the, dot, the uh, circumference of this? Get out a handy dandy piece of uh, string and just wrap around. Wrap it around like that. Wrap it around and kind of mark it with my fingernail. Get a rough estimation. Right there is the mark. And we'll just lay them on here. Now I did this before, so I'll show you what I did. Just made a mark on the table, laid it on there, made a mark at the other end. And, uh, and that's how I got the length of the circumference. And then simple enough matter, to measure it out, and it is 17 and an eighth inch. Okay, cool, let's go cut that out. So we know it's eight inches going this way. I had already, I already cut an angle in this piece of cardboard, in this piece of RAM board. So I have a 90 degree angle, and I know the piece is big enough because it's way oversized. So let's just start by cutting out the piece in this direction. And we know it's 17 and a quarter, and this is an 18 inch rule, so that makes it handy. This cut is completely non-critical. Doesn't matter, because it's just the top of the mold. It doesn't butt to anything, but we'll make it, make, make, make it nice and clean anyway. Okay, that all the way, yep, okay. Nice, now we need, what do we say, 17 and an eighth? Okay, on the edge, okay, 17 and an eighth. You know what? I'm gonna make it a little oversized. I'd rather trim it than do it again. So I'm gonna make it 17 and a quarter. Better to cut it a little bit oversized than to have to extend it. That would be a drag. So let's do that. Where's my mark? There it is. There we go. That doesn't look 90 degrees to me at all. Let me see, let me check. I want that to be square, straight up and down, boy. Let me see what I'm doing here. Yeah, it's not square. What happened there? That's square. Cutting it oversized anyway, so we'll trim it to fit. We're gonna have to put it on there. Okay, all right, cool. Got the piece, let's see if it fits. I want this cardboard to fit tight to the base, so I marked it so I know where it starts. And I'm gonna get it going right there. I also want it to be square, so I'm gonna use the table as my square. And I'm gonna bring this in to right to the right mark and clamp that on there, right there. So now, what that's gonna let me do is take some small screws, I'll put them over here, get out of the way, take some small screws. And again, we're gonna use the table, make sure I'm nice and tight. I drew a line to give me a halfway mark up the side of the base. Okay. see what I'm doing now I can take this off that did its job okay so now we're gonna work our way around about to here maybe will be the next one so I'm gonna work my way around and making sure that the cardboard is on there tight boy tight
We'll just work our way around with the screws. Okay, we'll work our way around to the next one, which we'll put in. This is a tight curve, so it wants, let's see if I can push that in. Maybe we'll turn it up like this. Let's see what's going to be the easy way. I want to make sure that we really stay true to the, ed to the edge. I don't want to come off that edge crooked. So that looks pretty good right there. That tight, that's tight. where it needs to be. I don't really think you need to watch me drive all these screws in. I'll do the rest of them and then we'll go on. Last one. Let's get it in. Right here. Let's see how we did. Ooh, that's pretty tight in there. Not bad. That's pretty good. Let's see if this thing is gonna come in handy now. Goes something like that. And that is my, why I saved this piece of wood. Nice, not bad. That is going to work like a champion. Let's wax it and go from there. I broke out the handy dandy crock pot and uh, filled it uh, with uh, beeswax and why I didn't buy one of these 20 years ago I do not know because this crock pot is the greatest thing in the history of mankind. Oh my god it's so beautiful it's so much easier than all the nonsense with the cans and the hot plates and the silliness. Picked that thing up at Target couple days ago. $11. <laughs> Unbelievable. Just works like a champion. Now the trick to beeswaxing is you want the beeswax to really soak into the wood. No fooling around with it. You want it to really soak in. And that also means around the edges. You got to get the edges really well waxed up. If you're wondering why the beeswax is red, I put oil paint in it, basically so you guys could see it better on video. Okay, now let's get this. This cardboard would stick to the rubber like almighty, like crazy, can't have that. So let's get this waxed. So the rubber is really contacting a film of wax. It's not, it's not contacting paper anymore. It's in contact with the molecules of the wax. One of nature's most miraculous substances, courtesy of the bees. Thank you, bees. Okay, just tripped a breaker. Okay, we're done. It's time to put Mr. Foot onto his base. To glue Mr. Foot to his base, we're just gonna coat him with sticky wax, then run the hot tool over everything to make sure the sticky wax is in fact sticky. And then we're gonna see if that's gonna be sufficient to jam him on there. Get him into position, just jam him on, stick him on. So there he is, he's on there pretty good, like that. But we want to make sure that he's not touching anywhere. He's good there. So he's really good there. Fine, fine, fine. Lots of room. No worries. Everywhere is good. 
It's good there. The only other place we have to wash. Yep, yep. It's good, 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 good. How about this side? Oh, yeah. He's good all the way around. He's good to go. <laughs> all right. Now, thing is, I don't love this base business. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to flow a, a lot of blue wax around him and under him and build out the connection between the foot and the base with blue sprue wax. The advantage of this blue sprue wax is that it flows like water and it, flows, it wants to flow into cracks. Really nice. And we can use it to just flow out and seal up underneath this foot, make a flat foot. This is going to be another area where there's going to be quite a bit of cleanup on the castings is on this on these feet because you have to if you're going to you know we're going to make a, a a connection like this where it's where it's flat in other words the foot doesn't cur doesn't t turn under so with each casting you're going to have to basically just kind of recarve the connection to the base it's just going to be the way it's got to be on this piece again you really want to think about how your sculpture sits on a base, how it reacts with the castings. See, I don't want any rubber to flow underneath those feet. I'd rather have a cleanup job on the sculpt than to have rubber flowing under those feet when we make the casting. That's why I'm welding him on really well. Also, this weld job really supports him. And I don't have to worry about him coming off. Got him pretty well welded around each one now. How we looking here, foot? How we looking? You see him? See how I did? I just sealed around those feet. I see a hole. That is no bueno. Here's Mr. Foot. He is ready to go. He is ready to put in the case. And that is what we are going to do now. Let's get the case in place. There's the my mark. Let's see if I can just do this where it's at, or if I'm gonna have to bring him nearer to the edge. Nothing like a pre-drilled hole. I tell you what, nothing like a pre-drilled hole. Let's go. Let's go, go, go. Let's keep going. How we doing? How we doing? I'm looking down inside there. Oh, yeah, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. Pretty nice. Okay, let's see. This goes like this. Oh, yeah, that's good. That is really good. Boy, that is not a problem at all. Very good. That's how our mold case is going to go together. Now, we're not going to fill it that deep, uh, but that's how it's going to go together. All right, we're going to pour some uh, rubber now. I'm using this big old container from the dollar store. Shaking my rubber. <laughs> Gonna mix up a pretty good wazoo, a pretty good wad of rubber <clears throat> because it's a big box. It's a big mold. So what I wanna do is I've got the scale all teared up. See how beautiful he teared it is? Let's set it to 40 grams. Let's just dump to 40. Okay. I dumped to 40. Did I go past 50? I did not. It's amazing that 10 grams affects that scale that much. Okay, so there's 50, 51. Yeah, about a little less, a hair less than 52 grams. Clean the bottle because I can't take drippies. I don't deal with drippies. Clean the bottle. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to head over. I'm going to put 520 grams because I need expansion room. All right, let's mix some rubber. Let's mix some rubber. This is a pretty good crock of rubber for our first pour. Let's get it mixed. Quick, quick, quick. You can see on the sides how you want to get it. Make sure you get it well mixed all the way around. All right. Put it over here, and away we go. Will this fit? Oh, I'm so good. I'm so good. Get it in the tank. So you can see the thing's pumping up. 
Oh yeah, it's rising up good. Let's get it to break. That's why you leave a lot of room in the container. You see how much it rises. It will keep on rising on you. Here we go. Now it's gonna break. And when it breaks and falls, right now, that's pretty much as much de-airing as I give it. I don't give it a lot more than that because you don't need to. Okay, let's pour this boy. I want to get this thing poured. Pour right into there. Here we go. And we got it. Let's just do it. Let's quit talking. Now what I did earlier, I did one good thing and one bad thing. The good thing is I poured yesterday before I left, I poured a gasket of about maybe a quarter of an inch thick of rubber on the bottom. And I, uh, that made sure that the bottom of this thing wasn't going to leak with this big heavy volume of rubber going into it. I would have no leaks whatsoever, and I won't expect to have none. Here we go. Let's pour this down in there. I'm leaking like crazy. Here we go. I have over the years used things like, like fancy, like spat, rubber spatulas, all that kind of stuff. But somehow, for some reason, it always just works better, and I seem to just go back to just keeping off cuts from the table saw, just sticks as my stirring and applying material. I don't know why. I think that just it's what's available, what's cheap, what's convenient, what works. May not be as pro looking. By the way, see how I'm getting rubber on that clamp? <laughs> Will not hurt it. Won't do anything bad to it. It'll just peel right off. So I don't worry about. That's one nice thing about silicone rubber. I do not like to get resin all over stuff. Because that stuff, you get it on there, you have you know bonded it in most cases. Just bonded it. Whereas rubber, nah. It generally speaking, unless it's a porous material, will peel right off of metals and plastics. What it might not do is not cure against a metal. You gotta be super careful with metals. In, in silicone rubber, they don't get. They could very well not get along. I think particularly copper and brass can inhibit the cure of, of, of silicone tin rubbers. So I'm going to say we're halfway, not quite halfway poured. Um, yeah, not quite halfway poured. Okay, the pour continues. Let's do this thing. Let's keep on pouring. Here we go. We're going to continue to pour. Let's just really dump it. Okay, let me stir my mix here. Wow, this mold's going to eat some rubber, let me tell you. I knew it would. I knew Mr. Foot was going to eat up some rubber. Notice I'm getting little drippies on the back. That's not ideal, but it's not fatal either because they're drippies. Uh, what you don't want to do is you don't want to make a blanket. You don't want to enrobe your model because then you're going to trap air. And you don't want to be trapping air. But this model is going to suck up a fair amount of rubber. It just is. It's just the nature of the beast. Hey, hey. All right, let's see if our chunkage can save us. Let's see how much we can jam in. And I guarantee you we're going to get a lot in there. Because we want a lot in there. Now, one thing that makes this particular, let me dispense out some chunks here, over here. One thing about these chunks is that they've got grooves in them. You do not want to put those grooves in such a way that they can catch air. Can you see those grooves in there? You, you want to make sure I'm putting them straight down, just straight down. And that way, the, the rubber runs up those grooves and it's not a, even a little bit of a problem. Thinner pieces like this, I can use the wedgie into places that I otherwise couldn't reach with the bigger chunks. I'm going to wedge a lot of little pieces into areas like that. I'm just going to jam as fast as I can and cram a lot of rubber down in there. I did one good thing when building this mold, but then I did one bad thing. The good thing was that I poured a gasket of rubber in the bottom, and that meant that there's absolutely no leakage. The bad thing that I did was I was going to pre-fill the mouth, and I didn't do it. So what I'm thinking about doing, I'm gonna. I, I'm so worried about that mouth and so pissed off at myself for having not 
pre-filled it because it's a deep kind of gash in the face and it's at an angle where it really could catch uh, a pretty wicked amount of bubbleage. We don't want that. We never want it because that, you know, to catch a bubble right in the middle of the face, um, that, you know, that does blow, to be, to be quite honest, because you don't want to have to, it's one thing to fit, you know, have to fix you know, a non-critical part of a sculpture and, you know, something that's simple, easy and quick to fix. And you just don't care that much that you had to fix it. But boy, when you have to fix the features of a face in a sculpt on a bunch of castings, um, you know, there really isn't. You just don't have a lot of options in that case. It's just a, a stout rope or a steep cliff to jump off of, uh, and you'll be fine. But uh, I don't mean to make light of it, but boy, it is such a pain to have to fix. I've seen I've seen mow makers put parting lines right across the center of a face, and I am like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why would you put a party line in the most critical part of the whole thing? But they do it. Seen it with my lion eyes. I should have pre-filled the mouth before I poured the main body of this mold. And I forgot to do so. So that was bad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill it now by tipping the mold like this and filling from this corner. And hopefully this will rise up through the mouth and not trap any air in there. We will know soon enough if my grand strategy will work. Let's keep going. Okay, so now the mouth is filling just about there. Okay, so the mm, just about. Okay, now so theoretically the mouth just filled. I'm gonna take one more topping batch, probably a couple hundred more grams, and we're gonna fill it to just about a quarter of an inch above that ear and we are ready to go. But we are also out of time for this week. Thanks for watching. I hope you liked the video. If you did, hit that like button. And if you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you next week.